Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. So, Blake, that bathroom smells way too much like lemon. Like, is it too lemony for you? Like, somebody overcorrected with the poopery? Like, somebody did it. <laughs> Like, had to. I couldn't smell anything other than the lemon, so I'm thankful for that. But uh, are you tasting lemon? I'm not tasting it. Well, it you just, didn't get enough lemon. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm tasting hair. I got hair <laughs> in my mouth. Hey, everybody! Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. Uh, you know, your all things end game spoiler and uh, Game of Thrones season eight, episode three discussion zone. We're going to be talking about all that today. So I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. You're safe. You're safe. This is a safe but what zone. What about that one thing that happened? Oh, there's a thing that happened. There's a couple things that happened, but it's okay. It's a safe zone. We're okay. Just uh, hang out. It's episode 128. We're here to talk human factors. It's April 29th, uh, and you're listening to or maybe even watching Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today, as always, by, well, maybe not as always, because there's a couple things here in the next couple of weeks. Where it will definitely not be me, as always. Yeah, and it won't be me, as always, either. So, yeah. uh, anyway, joined by Mr. Blake Arsdorf. Woo! There he is. I need, like, a applause. Um, oh, God. Last thing we need is more More, more soundboard clips. Yeah. Uh, we got a lot to talk about today. We're talking about Walmart unveiling their AI-powered store of the future. Um, scientists pulling speech directly from the brain. Google's wing uh, landing FAA first approval for drone delivery. And Amazon's system for tracking its warehouse workers and how it can automatically fire them. Oh, man. Yikes. Uh, but first, hey, we got some program. <laughs> Before we fire people with algorithms, we got this. We got this. Hey, uh, you can find us on YouTube every Tuesday around noon Pacific. Jeff is doing uh, some really great work putting us up every Tuesday. This is a really quick turnaround. You got to understand. So fast. A lot of production goes into this show, and it, it's it's really astounding to see it come up on my feed every Tuesday. It looks uh, so good. If you like what we do and want to support us, please go like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, we are just a few shy of 100, folks. I think we are going to do something special for the first 100 subscribers. So if you want to jump into the ground floor, please do that. Uh, you know, that, that helps us change the slash. We say this every week. It ch- helps us change the name of our YouTube channel slash name. So that way people can go YouTube.com slash Human Factors. I'm just uh, outlining the importance here. Yeah, and then we can just I, change the name of the podcast. I really hate begging. Crazy. I really hate begging, guys. Just, just We're do almost this. there. We're almost there. I promise I will stop once we're there. Uh, anyway, hey, what's going on in Blake's world? <laughs> Oh, man. Okay, so we talked about how we're not going to spoil anything in-game or Game of Thrones, right? Right. So let's talk about how... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. But it is... So it is everywhere, especially related to in-game, right? Yeah. I, I opened up three separate emails this morning alone right. from, like, a couple of financial institutions that I have, like, accounts from, like Robin Hood and Acorns and another one. Okay. And they, all of their content had to do and was centered around in-game. Okay, it's a well. First off, it's a cultural phenomenon. Absolutely, like, blew the box office out of the water, like far and above any other. Like it made a billion dollars this weekend in the box office. Yeah, alone. which is yeah, because I mean it was showing at movie theaters near me at four a.m. starting like to kick off Saturday and Sundays. It's nuts. It's a three-hour runtime, so people are sitting there in the theater for three hours, and you know, which is pretty because you've seen it, right? I have seen it. I mean, that's that had to be either a really good film or people were just muscling it out for a Marvel film because like three hours is pretty long. It's a long film. Three hours of one minute, good times. There's, there's there's a lot to cover in the movie. Lots of stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think the it's it's weird because it, it it excuse me, it's a long film, but it doesn't feel like it's it's decently paced to where you always feel like something's going on and you don't have to there's no real lulls. There's a couple parts that are slower than others, of course, but um, again, no spoilers. <laughs> well, that's cool. Spoil so it's like overall good, just sto- good storytelling anyway. I think so. Nice. Well I, so the funny part to me was is it's even impacting people that I don't that don't even like Marvel movies that I know in my life. Like, my mom sent me a text because she's coming in town in a week and was like, have you seen the new Endgame film? And I was like, no, because we were going to go see it with Elise's family. She's like, I want to see it. I was like, have you ever seen any of the Avengers films or any Marvel film ever? She's like, no. That's but ju- interesting. But just the the marketing and seeing it so much, I feel like that has an impact over time and it just being completely all over the zeitgeist. So like you can't touch social media or really talk to many people right. without like them saying, hey, "Hey, have you seen Endgame?" Like yeah. at, at work alone, I must have been asked at least 3 separate occasions just walking to the water cooler. Well, I said there's a lot that has to happen in that 3 hours or there's a lot to cover in that 3 hours and so people want to talk about things that happen. Sure, um, yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot that happens there. If you want to talk in game spoilers, Hit me up on our Slack. I'm happy to happy to chat. Or Game of Thrones season eight, episode three. 
Happy to talk about that go. too. That just happened last night, uh, and I'm sure you saw that this today in the office too. Like a lot of people were. Uh, oh, just heavy AirPod game today because yeah. I just could not eat because I'm me and Elisa are trying so hard to catch up on you're Game close. of Thrones. Yeah, we got you're less than a seven. season left. Don't spoil it. If you're on Twitter, don't spoil it for Blake. I haven't been on Twitter or any of that stuff in like I don't know since we started this, so about three weeks. Don't if you're on the Slack, like don't touching. don't spoil it. No spoilers. <laughs> no. We're being respectful of your time right now by not giving you in game or season uh, eight, episode three spoilers of yeah. Game of Thrones, and uh, we hope that you would do the same for Blake. But I'm all caught up. If you want to DM me directly, I'm happy to chat with you. <laughs> yes, there you go. DM Nick. Let him know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Blake, um, I have some news. So uh, a couple months ago, or I guess a couple weeks ago, I said that I won't be able to go to HFES this year. Did you say um, it on the podcast? I did say it on the podcast. Okay. Uh, I, I mentioned it uh, briefly, um, and I'm, I'm really kind of heartbroken about this because I, I love going to HFES. I love interacting with some of our listeners there. It's a great opportunity for um, you know networking and all that stuff. And absolutely. We had a phenomenal run last year, so I'm, I'm absolutely devastated that uh, I will not be able to go this year. Um, however... The reason I'm not going this year is a is a uh, drum roll, please. is a is a good occasion. Uh, I am expecting the birth of uh, my first child. Yes, on October twenty seventh. So, master congratulations to Nick. Thank you, thank you. So, yeah, that's happening October twenty seventh. Uh, and man, I I got to say, this whole pregnancy thing, uh, you know, has been has been really hard for me to keep a secret. Uh, I'm very excited. Yeah, because you've known for a very long time, and it wasn't until like a couple weeks ago that I think I even found out, right? Yeah. So, so I told close friends and family at 12 weeks, um, you know, and and so like it's just it's it's this weird thing because so my partner's in her first trimester, and and she's um, it's this really weird like you want to reach out and ask for help because the first trimester is the worst, where like you know your body is going through all these changes, and she. She was she's doing great, but I mean, like you know, she she was basically morning sickness every day, puking almost every day. Like goodness, it's hit her hard. Yikes! Uh, and so, like, I've been as supportive of a partner as I can. You know, uh, sure, s- skipping out on some uh, uh, Patreon bonus episodes. That's that's my fault. That's my fault, guys. So uh, you know, so that I could go home and and uh, tend to my partner. Definitely. And, um, yeah, it's just been it's been an interesting experience because, like I said, that the first three months is like where everything happens, and and uh, but that that's also the period of time where there's most likely things to go wrong, and so you kind of don't want to announce it or anything until after the twelve week mark, and so um, yeah, we, yeah, we're expecting. <laughs> so here we are, yeah. So and you're gonna put like the announcement or whatever inside, yeah, yeah. our uh, videos and stuff. Yeah, right? I'll, I'll have uh, I'll have the announcement photo gif thing. So it's it's really interesting. So um, I. You know, I have the uh, the little announcement photo gif here. It's um, it's the Force of Strong in my family, baby Rome, October twenty seventh, and the best. Uh, uh, you know, it's got some Star Wars. I really encourage it. people if you're not if you don't listen to it on YouTube, go check it out anyway, just for this. But I'm sure Nick will put it in the Slack too for people to look at. Damn it, Blake! Now I have to put it in the Slack. Uh, yes, yes, you do. I will. Uh, yes, you do. Because we love our <laughs> we love people to listen to this we anyway, do. regardless if they we touch do. YouTube or not. I will totally do that. I I gotta say though, like this ultrasound is um, that so I it's a GIF and inside the picture that of of the ultrasound there's there's movement and uh, this was at like twelve weeks ish. And this is the most I've ever seen an ultrasound move. Like so much movement. There's a lot of movement there. Like basically this, running the marathon inside. Yeah, it's this amazing. Baby is going all over the place. And uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, if uh, yeah, it, it's it's weird, man. It's weird. Becoming a first time parent is is weird. And I'm nowhere near ready, but I'm very excited. Um, so yeah, well, you'll that. do great. It'll be awesome. Oh, thanks, man. So much Star Wars. Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of Star Wars in this kid's <laughs> life. That is for sure. <laughs> there's there was something I don't know if it was on like an Instagram post or whatever, but I saw you reading I think a Star Wars book to one of your cats, and when you told me that you were you and Justine were expecting, I was like, that's <laughs> totally gonna be this kid when he's when he's growing up, just listening was to it, Star Wars books. Was I reading it or what, like, I feel out like loud you were? Or? No, it was just a picture of oh, you okay. reading oh. it to the cat. Yeah, it's probably because the cat was like on top of my book and couldn't. Oh, I'll yeah. try to find that too. <laughs> you know what else is going to be in this kid's life though, which is I I feel bad for them. Uh oh. Human factors g- news. They're going to get so much human factors news <laughs> having me as a dad. And uh, sorry, if you, <laughs> sorry, uh, oh, child so from the future, if you are watching. Um, future child. Yeah. yeah if you're How watching, crazy is that? They'll have a whole catalog of things they can watch on YouTube or listen to of your voice. Like from the jump. Yeah, that's weird. So um, 
Yeah, it's it's a it's a weird kind of thing. I I don't know how else to describe it, but it's a weird kind of thing. Um, so yeah, this is Human Factors News. This is where we search far and wide to bring uh, you stories that the uh, you know that deal with all the topics of human factors, aviation. Uh, we got some artificial intelligence in there today, some cybersecurity, uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> a lot of stuff. Whatever it is, as long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is fair game for us to talk about. Blake, what do we got up first this week? Up first, we got Walmart unveiling some AI-powered stores of the future. So Walmart has unveiled a new store of the future and testing grounds for emerging technologies, including AI-enabled cameras and interactive displays. The store, a... The, oh, here we go. The store, a working concept called <laughs> Intelligent <laughs> Retail we'll Lab, or IRL for short, operates out of a Walmart neighborhood market in Levittown, New York. The store is open to customers and is one of Walmart's busiest neighborhood market stores containing more than 30,000 items. Wow, that's a lot of stuff in one place. So the store has a lot has a suite of cameras mounted in the ceiling, and these AI-powered cameras will monitor inventory levels to determine, for example, if staff need to bring out more meat from the back room if from refrigerators to restock the shelves, or if some fresh items have been sitting for too long on the shelf and need to be pulled. The general idea is that AI will help the store associates know more precisely where and when to restock its products, and this, in turn, means that customers will know what the, pro- the produce and the meat is always fresh and in stock as they arrive. So that's kind of an interesting thing, Nick, because really, when I think of Walmart, I don't think of a grocery store. So I guess that's something that's now integrated into, ca- into their ecosystem in general. Yeah, they've been doing grocery for a while. Um, the, yeah, it's... So the interesting thing about grocery is that you have perishable items, and... Um, you know, well, part of the part of the trick of actually grocery shopping is trying to find uh, fresh ingredients um, that you can prepare, a- as well as like kind of sorting through what's good and what's not. And so, kind of what the hope for this AI powered system for Walmart, at least, is not to fire their employees, but rather <laughs> we'll get to that. One later. <laughs> we'll get to that one later. It's not to fire their employees, but also it's it's to kind of analyze um, how long has something been out. And um, when does that thing, like, has it been picked up? Uh, do things need restocking? And so all this is in an effort to get Walmart employees uh, to spend less time kind of, like, surveying the store and, uh, you know, what needs restocking. You know, Vice getting an alert saying, hey, this thing needs restocking. Um, and more about getting those same employees to engage with the people. Um which is great, right? I'm, I'm going to read a couple points here. Do it. Um, so for store associates, the, si- the system allows them to stop constantly walking the store to replace inventory. Instead, they'll know what to bring out from the back room before the doors even open to customers that day. Um, so no more, like, I remember when I worked retail, I would go count the shelves and say, okay, we need that thing, that thing, that thing. Hold it in my memory. Walk to the back. Try to pick up that thing, that thing, that thing. I inevitably forget something. Walk out, uh, you know, stock the shelves, and then go back because I missed something, go, okay, I need one more of those and, and pull it out and put it there. Uh, and so imagine if there was just an order, like it pulled out a slip and said, you need one of these, one of these, one of these, one of these, one of these. And you could just make one run from the back with a cart full, go out and stock the shelves. That'd like, be the way to go. I mean, that saves you so much time as just an employee alone. Yeah. And then as a cu- from the customer perspective, you're getting, in this case, since we're talking about groceries, much better produce or stuff that hasn't just been, you know, either manhandled or that's gotten old and nasty over time. So that's pretty great. Yeah. So um, there's a, yeah, it, it does let customers have more fresh items, right? They're, they're, uh, the, this whole thing is, is meant to better, fit, more efficiently run stores. Um, but, you know, still keep the same amount of associates. So, um, yeah, I don't know. That's that's an interesting point. W- there's a couple other things in this article that I want to point out here. Um, one interesting bit is that they have this, uh, the, the cameras and the sensors in the store. They're pumping out 1.6 terabytes of data. That's scary insane. Per second. Every second. Oh, my. How um, much do they have in a day? Yeah. So that's the, I, right? That Well, it, math. I, I would imagine that it's only operable during store hours or shortly after, um, you know, shortly outside that window. So you take about half the day off, right? Uh, but I'd imagine it also keeps a cache and then purges like, you know, a month, you know, uh, it, like holds a month worth of storage or something. I wonder if it would be useful for them to keep it for trends. 
Well, I'd imagine they'd keep the data, but the actual like camera data, I would, I don't think I think Raw they'd purge footage. that. Yeah. But the the like zeros and ones of is something there? When did it go? I think that you know is data that they would keep. Um, but yeah, that's that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of data. That's a lot. Of, uh, so that's a lot of data just to capture, but then processing too, and then thinking about like how quickly which is the benefit of, I guess, AI in this case, but how quickly it's got to kind of make decisions based off of that amount of data in one second right. to transmit it to, I guess, an associate who's got to go make a decision based off of that. So that's that's pretty incredible, just computing power alone. Yeah, so Walmart has the resources to do this, and uh, it'd be interesting to see what kind of other applications that this can be applied to, right? this I feel like produce and um, perishable items are kind of the um the most advanced you can get because they're on a schedule if you have expiration dates tied to things you know when something was put out you know when that's expired um and so because of that you can always make sure that things out on the shelves are like you know still within their freshness window or whatever and whereas like just regular stocked items that's like um y- you know there's no time limit on those it, there might be but they're less less uh Time window, smaller time window. <laughs> That's what sure. I'm to they say. got like a longer shelf life for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, I mean, when we're talking about customer experience, that so, some of that has to do with how the store just looks in general, and maybe this ability to watch, you know, section of the store over time during the day can again stop a associate from just having to stroll the store the entire right. day and maybe be more, fo- more more focused on talking to people. Although I don't know about you, I get, I get kind of weirded out when like I have an associate that's like a little too in yeah. my face about things that like trying to help me. Well, um, where is this one at? This one's at... Uh, it's in New York, I New think. New York. Okay. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because I, I feel the same way. Like, I just... I wouldn't want to get out, get in, get out, and go. Yeah. Even um, if I can't find something, I usually won't ask. Yeah. That's the worst. Same. The, the, I will say there's one other interesting aspect of this, and that's that Walmart is kind of really going all in on this AI. And um, I, I think there's something about artificial intelligence that kind of weirds the public out right you and i talk about it every week and so it's less like we find it cool and interesting and the application but i feel like there's like this um misconception in the public that uh you know artificial intelligence is gonna take over the world and blah 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 and i feel like they're trying to capture that here so they have this uh what is this called this is like a, a um an interactive wall and this kind of lets the customers have fun with artificial intelligence. So it, de- it demonstrates how an artificial intelligence system can estimate body positioning. But really, it's, it's the, the real purpose of this is to kind of uh, make this new technology that they're using in this store seem less intimidating, which is, is really interesting, right? That's pretty cool, yeah. I mean, it's a fun way for people, I guess, to get to know AI or maybe understand its applications. Um, but I think Walmart's being smart about it. Just taking a look at the like the image of this wall because it, it's it's not necessarily like somebody's going to attribute that to being AI or artificial intelligence or anything like that. They're just going to be like, yeah, it's a cool interactive wall, but not necessarily having to worry about what's behind it. Right. Does that makes sense. I mean, their their um, their whole thing is that they want to make this technology seem less intimidating, and so I wonder if they're going to have like it is an interactive wall, and I wonder if it goes beyond. You know, just the you see your body on it and it makes the shapes or whatever. And uh, will it actually have inf- information about how AI is is being used in the store to better suit the needs of the customers? Yeah, I don't know, because it's a, it's probably a fine balance, right, between like do, how much do you tell a customer when they come in the store or how much do they really want to know where you could use kind of this AI system. Right. Let's say you had produce that have been out for a while, but you have let's say, you know, digital readouts for what the price is. And if you just slash the price on the digital readout when stuff gets older, like put it on clearance, that could be powered by AI, but nobody has to know that it's being powered by AI. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Uh, But, I mean, Walmart in general has made a very interesting play into technology, especially over the past couple of years, because they've got, like, Walmart lab places all over the country now that are really focusing on the user experience of tech, how to bring in machine learning and AI into their stores, and what it really means, how it's going to impact people. So it's it's kind of funny that such a big, you know, retail giant has made a really big step into just tech in general. So it's kind of cool to see. Yeah, some of the next steps here are really interesting. So after the meat inventory levels are, are um, using that, AI system right after they've kind of done this dry run 
uh, they're they're kind of looking at uh, uh, AI systems to ensure that shopping carts are available for customers. Um, so whether that's like pinging a uh, a, a lot attendant to go out and wrangle up all the carts and put it, you know, instead of like uh, waiting until all of them are out. I don't know. It, it that'll be cool to see too. And then also making sure that registers are open and staffed when they need it. Um, so like instead of waiting in line, maybe they call more employees from the floor that are trained on registers to come forward when the demand demands it, right? Because there can be a surge of people. Absolutely. So to see, you know, employees kind of shift roles and kind of have this like uh, sort of floating role, it's going to change the way people work, but I think it's for the better. It's getting them, giving them more skills um, because technology is being employed in ways that demand it. Yeah, and I think ultimately it, it does the justice of giving them more skills. And then I, I, I would assume if I didn't feel like I was having to walk around the store and just kind of aimlessly figure out where stuff needed to be restocked, I would feel like I was using my time more wisely more in my job. Yeah. And so I would just feel generally better about my job. Yeah, um, I mean, but look, like that, that does bring up a good point. We are spinning this in a pretty positive light. Sure. But, I mean, if you think about it from the employee's perspective, like – there are going to be some people who this is like an efficiency thing, and there are going to be some people that says, okay, they're literally trying to get me to work every second of every day that I'm there. And whereas, like, you know, maybe maybe someone finds kind of comfort in that I'm going to look for these things and go to the back and not interact with customers and, you know, pick up these things and then go and fill them up. So maybe, in a sense, that, that, that could be, like, some of the negative side, right? Yeah, I mean, it could definitely force, you know, who, I don't know how Walmart works, but I could see, like, you start putting productivity markers related to when something gets, like, cashed out to takes. somebody. How long does it take you? How many customers are you interacting with? What's the quality of those interactions that we can see on camera while you're not restocking things? How productive are you during all the time that we don't have you restocking? What are you really doing? Yeah. There's a lot of kind of scary implications of it of course because if the cameras are seeing that much about produce every second they're probably seeing a lot about how people move throughout the store every second and how employees are in- interacting through every second yeah so it's there's and then we're definitely spinning it very positively <laughs> and then maybe they link into amazon and when they don't meet those markers ai fires you. yeah there we'll we get go. there we'll we're, get there we're getting there all right blake what do we got up next okay so here we go in a feat that could eventually unlock the possibility of speech for people with severe medical conditions, scientists have successfully recreated the speech of healthy subjects by ta- tapping directly into their brains. So the technology is a long, long way from a practical application, but the science is real and the promise is there. So researchers at UC San Francisco published a paper in Nature citing, for the first time, this study demonstrates that we can generate entire spoken sentences based on an individual's brain activity. This is an exhilarating proof of principle that with technology that is already within reach, we should be able to build a device that is clinically viable in patients with speech loss. So to be perfectly clear, this isn't some magic machine that you can sit in and it translates your thoughts into speech. It's a complex and invasive process that decodes not exactly what the subject is thinking, but what they are actually speaking. So while the system still has a long way to go, the good news is it's a start, and there are plenty of conditions that it would work for. So collecting critical brain and speech recording data could be done preemptively in cases where a stroke or degeneration is considered a risk. So, Nick, this sounds so promising, and I really appreciate it when we get papers like this, especially from somewhere like Nature, where they're saying, like, this technology is really cool, but it's not where it needs to be, but it's at least a really good promise for what you could see in the future. Yeah, uh... Yeah, this is really interesting to me, and I'm struggling to find application, although I know there's tons of application, right? Because uh, thinking about what this actually is doing, so it's it's decoding what you're saying based on brain patterns, and th- that's interesting in its own way. However, like, you actually have to speak this thing, and so I'm wondering, I don't know, it's decoding what you're speaking, by monitoring brain patterns. And so maybe once you've trained maybe a system that understands, you know, basic speech patterns, maybe you can extract it from thought. Like if you were to think about speaking, I'm just trying to think of how this can help people that maybe can't, they're like paralyzed and they can't actually 
move their mouth in a way that allows them to speak, right? But if they can think it, then they can decode it. I don't know. I Yeah, it, you've got a lot of bullet points here, and maybe it illuminates it a little bit, but I'm kind of in the same realm you are, because my immediate thought was maybe this is something similar to AI, like we were just talking about, or maybe machine learning is a better way to think about it. Like, if you're able to get a, a large sample of people and have them speak, you know, specific sentences, and over time you, like, gather a full lexicon of words and all that kind of stuff. It's almost a sure. database of speaking. Yeah. And that's re- that's recording a bunch of different people's, you know, brain electrical signal firing patterns, and maybe that show- has some similarities across groups. I don't really know, but then I would assume maybe that maybe some device is able to then, in people that are stroke victims or have degenerated diseases or malfunctions in the brain if that was what they were able to do is read kind of their minds if you will and cr- and create speech either through a machine or by text or any kind of other way that's the only way i could see this working but i feel like i feel like the way the paper phrases it means there is definitely a lot of work to be done because they're only getting to like you said they hear verbal speech and they're able to kind of translate that or map it to what your brain's doing i mean the thing that gives me hope this is in nature and like they wouldn't just accept any old paper. So, oh yeah, like th- this is obviously very significant for the field, and I, maybe maybe there's just a bigger picture that you know, since we're not experts in this field at all, like maybe this is there. There are applications out there that you and I are not seeing. Um, you know, uh, going through some of these bullet points here. Um, yeah, that one, Blake. <laughs> they uh, they oh, map- sorry. No, no, no. That's okay. That's that's the one I was going to bring up here. They basically map this brain activity. Um, to a virtual model in a machine learning system, so the AI piece of it, uh, essentially allowing a recording of a brain to control a recording of a mouth. So um, that's interesting, right? Because you're not turning abstract thoughts into words. You're understanding the brain's concrete instructions to the muscles of the face and determining from those which words those movements would be forming. Oh, wow. So it's not even really just about the thought. It's how your brain's even producing a word. Right. So that's interesting on another level. Um, what? Yeah. Whoa. So that's that's a totally different construction than I would have ever thought, right? Because I wonder what that means in terms of if something's going to read your mind. Is it is it even along the same lines or similar to like creating you saying something? It's It's not mind reading. It's brain reading. That, yes. So, so, so I guess the the difference there. Let's say let's call reading your mind. Like if I w- if I was thinking something, right? Like thinking "Hi Nick" versus saying "Hi Nick." Right. I wonder what how that looks in your brain in terms of if it's different or not. Well, so they do mention specific areas. I mean, we're if you're in psychology, you have a psychology background. You know these Wernicke's and Broca's mm-hmm. uh, areas. So they're looking at those um, and and kind of looking at certain patterns of brain activity that comes after you think and arrange these words in these areas. Uh, but before those signals are sent to the motor cortex, so like making your mouth and tongue move to create these words. So there, there's this uh, intermediate signal between those um, so and and like I guess what do you do with that signal, right? It, that's cool in the sense that you can understand the speech production. Um, and I'm wondering if there are ways to repair these areas that are so critical for forming speech and understanding speech that might have applications here, like or even like getting a little more invasive, right? Could you stimulate those parts of your brain when somebody's right. trying to talk? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so. Yeah, it's it's one of the it's very tricky, right? Because there there seems like there is application, but I don't know that I don't know what the technology how that how technology stands that allow that like gives people their speech. Um, I'm trying to think, their like speech cortex back, if you right. will, and that's not right, but gives their their speech faculties back if they're able to if we're able to like stimulate parts of the brain or understand like speech speech production speech production from like a neuronal level. Yeah, and yeah, I don't, I don't know. There are people smarter than us that will understand the applications of this immediately. Absolutely. Um, and uh, and if you know, please hop in the Slack and let us know the applications because I would love to know. Because neuroscience is something that I've always had a passion about, but don't know a whole lot about it. Yeah. Um. So it, it's really cool that, that I mean, like this is awesome. We we know more now than we did, and and if you can um, map a database, then that's that's awesome. Interesting. Yeah. Uh. Let's see here. 
Can I read this last line? Yeah, go for it. Because this is kind of the problem statement of the entire method they're talking about earlier. So it, this requires, obviously, a great deal of carefully collected data with somebody with a health, healthy speech system. So for many people, it's no longer the case that they can even collect this kind of data, say, like a severe stroke victim. And for others, the invasive method alone is just going to make it impossible for a doctor to say, yes, this is a good idea for my patient. So it seems like that right now it's it's relying on gathering the data versus being able to implement it in you know, people that have severe conditions. Maybe if you fall in the intermediate range of where your condition is, maybe it could be a viable option, but it seems like if you're on the extreme case, it's a little tougher. Yeah, I don't know. The, 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 you and I are very much all about the application, right? Oh, like, actually, that's, absolutely. That's where we're stuck in. This is like, we can't sit here and, and uh, you know, say this, this, this is an amazing achievement for understanding what the brain does. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm, ju- I'm just curious to see what the application is. That's all. I'm not trying to badmouth this study at all. This is, this is great. No, this is really, really cool. And the last line in this kind of problem statement makes me think that there is an application after time has gone on. So it talks about condi- I agree. conditions that have actually prevented somebody from ever talking are going to make this method at this point in time not applicable. So you can't even use it. But I'm wondering if as we get down the road and and like BCIs maybe become more commonplace. Oh, absolutely. It starts kicking off you being able to speak for the first time because it's able to mimic how other people are able to, you know, produce sound or go through speech production. So it, yeah. it has a lot of awesome application, but the science alone is pretty incredible. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'll be interested to see where this one goes. We'll follow your career with great interest. All right. Uh, we'll be back to break down the news stories, the rest of the news stories, right after this short break. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. You know, I just realized. No. When I told everybody that I was expecting, uh, I, I realized that the timeline of that may look bad. I, I proposed to my partner, uh, and if you count back, that lines up with. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but you have an interesting story about that, right? I do yeah. because because we found out a week before I proposed, and you know, we figured it out anyway. <laughs> Justine had no idea, right? No idea. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So anyway, that is everything turned out better than expected. Hot um. <laughs> I just had to say that anyway. Uh, before we continue, I just want to thank all of our friends over at TechCrunch, Recode, and Technology Review for all of our stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us on social media or join us on our Slack for links to the original articles. And we do post those as we find them. It's a great place to kind of share information about human factors. All right, we got two more, Blake. What do we got up next? All right, so the FAA announced last Tuesday that Alphabet's Wing Aviation is authorized to start delivering goods via drone later this year. So it Wing had partnered with Mid-Atlantic Aviation Partnership and Virginia Tech as a participant in the Transportation Department's Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integration Pilot Program, an initiative that accelerates drone integration and helps the department and the FAA devise rules surrounding drones. So the approval is definitely an important one, given that this marks the first time the FAA has granted a so-called air carrier certification for drone delivery of items such as food, medicine, and small consumer products. Wing plans to reach out to the local community before getting started in order to get a sense of the needs. So still, there's a long way to go before consumer delivery via drone is a widespread reality in the United States. And it probably won't be until 2020 or 2021 that the FAA implements broader rules for drones that would set out and lay the way for more delivery package, delivering of packages via drone. So this is something that I feel like I've been part of or dealing with since I was in grad school because early in grad school I got involved in kind of UAS and what does that mean for just 
aircraft in general. And now we're at the point where we're like, we're not talking about giant UAS anymore. We're talking about drones are going to deliver stuff to people's houses. And now, surprisingly, this wasn't Amazon that pulled this off, but a Google offshoot has now figured out how they're going to start doing this in cooperation with the FAA in Virginia. Yeah, well, they started doing this in, in Australia, right? Yeah, that's actually, that's a funny part about the entire article. That's how they were able to get this push through with the FAA, because they had so much data to back up, like, we can do this, and here's the things that are dangerous, and here's what we need to watch out for, because they've been doing tests in Australia. Yeah, yeah, that's that's cool. So I, I really like this. I, f- I feel like every story that we're reading today is kind of like future, like we're, hang on, can I, can I, can I do this? We're in the future. Oh wait, that was that was crazy. <laughs> that was not what I was expecting. I think I was expecting something, something more like this. this. No, that's weird. All right, it's anyway, still I'm crazy. Gonna, I'm gonna stop playing Lots with this. Lots of modulations this. today. Yeah. No, I feel like we're living in the future now because I mean, this. So FAA is a big deal, right? Can you talk a little bit about FAA and what that means to get like uh, to, to at least work with them? Um, to kind of get approved. Like, so I what is really it? don't have any experience with the FAA themselves. I'm definitely not the person to ask, but I know that the going through the process of trying to get this approved for like higher, I guess, higher tiers or higher levels of airspace is really, really difficult because of the safety problems and all the regulations that FAA has surrounding safety, like from from the higher from, tiers of airspace. Yes. And but even st- in trying to define it in these lower tiers that we're going to deal with with like, you know, potentially fire or cops having drones and then like now we're talking about consumer delivery and stuff right. like that i mean this is really going to be a test case for how does the consumer part even integrate into what already exists right and this is going to be this is going to be interesting because we've talked about these smart cities where they're going to have to um, integrate drones of multiple multiple professions and and services right like like you said firefighting drones uh law enforcement drones um all these things are going to be operating at different levels and so um you know, and and the resolution between each level is going to have to become finer and finer because, you know, there's there's only so far up you can go to still be effective, um, at least with drone piloting, right? So, uh, and especially for things like emergency services and whatnot. Um, so yeah, where where do consumer consumer drones live in that in that uh, hierarchy? Um, yeah, there's kind of a funny. It's it's not really a funny thing, but it's like there was this concept there, or there used to be a concept in just general aviation called the highway in the sky. And I think that's still going to play a role here in like lower tiers of airspace. Cause think about if we start putting in like just general, maybe surveillance drones, uh, law enforcement drones, firefighting drones, anything that has to do with like, you know, medevac or anything like that yeah. and consumer drones. Now we've got to figure out some sort of priority scheme for what happens if they're operating in the same level of airspace because one thing this article mentions a little bit later is although they're going to have pilots for these drones, of course, that one pilot could be piloting five separate drones at one time. So right. what does that mean for in terms of like how somebody deals with a, like an emergency in that level of airspace or whatever it is? Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting kind of multivariate problems they're going to have to wade through as these get integrated more and more. And the, 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 the truth of the matter is I don't really know how much – is already integrated in our like UAS NAS system when it comes yeah. to law enforcement or uh, firefighting. Yeah, I mean they bring up some good points here that they're going to have to get around some of these uh, issues uh, like noise restrictions, safety, and air traffic control. We just talked about air traffic control, but um, you know safety kind of goes hand in hand with that. You know, prioritizing emergency vehicles uh, or uh, emergency drones rather first. Um, but the noise restriction one is an interesting one because I feel like you just fly high enough to not be a problem maybe but that even exists now right like you can't fl- you can't take flights at certain times of the evening because of like noise restrictions in the city especially in a place yeah. like san diego right where you've got basically aircraft flying really close to over top of buildings to right. like, go in and take off so it is it is a lot of noise but drones i mean it's going to depend on the type like how big is it are we talking like some little dji dji drone that just makes a little buzz right. noise do we know how big these are um, um they give a little like a little breakdown they're like i think they are like three by three and they're 11 pounds so they're kind of wingspan hefty of things three feet um yeah 11 pounds they can fly up to 400 feet above the ground okay uh and they can carry packages that weigh up to or a little more than three pounds 
So that's pretty small, but still, that's that's a lot of stuff that's being delivered by aircraft. Yeah, and if you think about sort of the long term application of this and and how it could expand uh, and scale, right? If you have, like, I'm just imagining city skylines are going to be, um, I don't want to say polluted, but polluted, polluted with with vehicles in the sky and. Is that the future we want? That's that sounds kind of cool, actually. Like thinking about the city of San Diego's skyline, just sitting there with a bunch of drones flying from point to point. Um, I don't know. That's that's kind of cool. Yeah, and I don't really know. I don't know that they present well as far as we're aware now, like a real environmental risk at the moment. Yeah, although I wonder if this will be less used in cities because uh, in order to drop something off at somebody's home, they would have to uh, and. Or business, right? Like, there's a lot of tall buildings in San Diego. And so, like, you'd have to drop it off at the ground level for somebody to pick it up versus just a doorstep, right? Like, yeah. So, this might be more rural than urban, right? Like, Maybe. Or does it, I mean, there's a potential, of course, for this to create different types of jobs that didn't exist before. So, right, it's like, like a company that's getting a bunch of deliveries. Maybe there's somebody who is making sure the drones drop off at the right time and whatever they're picked up, it's right. brought up throughout just like the a, building. Just like a train of drones, just. One package, another package, another package, another package, and then it's somebody's job to come and scoop them all up and deliver them in the building. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. This that 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 introduces a whole other thing. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's interesting. That is interesting. All I right. really like that they're focusing on the fact that they're going to bring food and beverages and meals to people. Like that's the first line of oh. bringing stuff. It's it's not like consumer products. Like I th- I was always picturing Amazon drones just sure. dropping your package off at your door, whatever like books you order. Or whatever, yeah. yeah. But this is talking about basically like, I don't know, Uber Eats of drones delivering you McDonald's or yeah. anything like that. Right? You just recently discovered DoorDash, didn't you? I did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you That's imagine? the most dangerous thing. Can you imagine? Like, Because I can imagine like companies taking this too. Like uh, any, any company that you can think of, um, kind of think about fast food, um, even prepared food, or like the curbside to go even stuff. Like... Thinking about offering that as a service instead of paying a delivery driver or outsourcing to DoorDash. Now, instead, you are providing that service direct to the consumer and you reap all the benefits of delivery costs instead of uh, somebody like DoorDash. So there's incentive there for companies to kind of get their own infrastructure up and running, too. And how do they integrate with other people? That's the whole air traffic control issue. Yeah, Um, I feel like if a service really gets this right and is valued at the like right price. I think that they could probably buy a lot of like the DoorDashes and Grubhub and stuff like that and integrate it into a single oh, service. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, they can. So it would, it would, there's a lot of potential here, but I mean, this is again, we're talking about one case, test case in Virginia, but still I think it's a lot of promise because it's it, like I know I said that I would have expected Amazon to do this first, but it's coming out of Alphabet or Google, however right. you want to look at it. And for some reason I have more faith in how they like take on user experience and the sure. end to end process. So I feel like that we might see some we might see something really cool come out of all of this. Or it just doesn't work or it's not something that makes sense I to do. I hope it works. I hope it works. I want I want the future where you and I are about to podcast and we just order food and it's like dropped from the sky for us before we get in here. And and you know that's that's the future. Yeah, that just I see want. like us getting out of our cars and just grabbing whatever the literally drops. something falls from the sky and we just grab it, you know, and and we come in and eat our lunch while we prepare the show notes and and then yeah. I honestly I would half I halfway would want to well I'd love to be able to like have input in the design of the interfaces that do that help pilots kind of navigate and do all this stuff. Yeah, but I would love to get the certificate that they talk about to be able to pilot five of these at once and understand oh, yeah. what that would be like. Yeah, I have no idea. Like, as I, I'd imagine, there's some swarm tactics there that that if you're piloting one, they all kind of follow the leader, and that's that's a whole separate conversation, I think. But yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, be fun. All right, we got one more story up today. What do we have up next? Oh, speaking of talking good about Amazon, so a world where people are monitored and supervised by machines isn't confined to the realms of sci-fi. Of course not. We live in 2019. It's here now. So there have been many reports over the recent years about unpleasant conditions workers face at Amazon warehouses. Employees are under pressure to pack hundreds of boxes per hour and faced being fired if they aren't fast enough. So from the automation perspective, Amazon tracks every individual worker's productivity, 
and automatically generates warnings or even terminations without any input from supervisors. The company has said to, said to just release people. So managers are, can override this process, but it doesn't say how regular any kind of managers actually do so. So Amazon says the termination process can be appealed, but Amazon isn't the first or last company to use this kind of managed by algorithm way of thinking. So we've seen this from Uber drivers complaining about similar practices from Uber. And this is definitely not the first fired by computer case. And as automa automation marches on, you think these stories are likely to become more commonplace over time. So I don't know. I, I, th I think I'd like to upfront first kind of give Amazon's retort to this because I guess this got published and they kind of wanted to clarify that they don't they don't actually just fire people automatically through through an algorithm. They always they never dismiss an employee without first ensuring that they receive any kind of support. So if somebody's not doing well, they give them training for it. Um, they're not just firing people willy nilly through algorithms or so they say. So. That's something that's worth pointing out. Sure, is maybe this is the way this is framed is not so great. Uh, it needs the the title of this story needs to have like it's a flagging algorithm for poor work for poor performance that could lead to termination, which is probably going to show up in Walmart's AI system, right? I mean, because you're, yeah, you're going to now be tracking their productivity in a whole different scale than you ever could before. Well, I mean, okay, so if you look at just metrics tracking productivity, like this exists everywhere now, and in fact, like employment practices still will talk to you and, and try to improve your performance if you are not meeting, um, you know, the performance standards of the company like that, that exists. And so this is just weird because it's taking artificial intelligence and flagging things because it's taking new metrics that may or may not match up to what they're actually doing. I don't know. It's it's I think, again, this whole concept of artificial intelligence weirds out the public and so there's this like negative view about it where really it's just tracking new metrics that can't be done uh in other traditional ways yeah and also too we're talking about like i think there's a stark difference we can draw i got too many thoughts going on in my head so there's <laughs> a stark difference between maybe what you and i do day to day and how people would measure performance or like what are the key performance indicators of our job versus being in a warehouse where you have very specific things that you need to do and do within an hour, day in and day out, depending on what orders are coming in or sure. how much needs to exit. So, I mean, the the kind of KPIs that you'd be dealing with there are mu lend themselves much more to like a metric-based system that an algorithm could judge you on and flag you on quickly, whereas for stuff that we do... It they, that kind of stuff does exist. Like, do you deliver right. things on time? But like, when we're talking of quality of work, well, that's a different story, and that leads somebody to right. need to come and talk to you about it so you can improve. And I think the same thing happens here. But uh, I don't know. It's it's a tough one for me because I've never worked in an Amazon factory. I don't know what it's like from their management perspective. But I right. know any time in any of my past jobs that somebody has come to me and said, "You're not performing to either if they were like." compare me to some KPI at a startup where I've experienced that or somebody just wasn't satisfied with the quality of my products I was putting together. Right. You don't learn how to do anything better or how to hold yourself to a higher standard without talking, have somebody come in talking to you. Yeah. So I'm glad they did clarify because yeah, that that's always something you should do if, if you're not meeting the employer's standard. I just, I, I know what this is like because like when, back when I worked retail way long ago, like they would have you, have to they would require a certain percentage of your transactions as a cashier to be to have them fill out that that survey at the bottom so if you get one of those things with a survey on it fill that out because you're helping out the person oh um, i never knew that i didn't know that impacted anybody oh yeah yeah oh yeah there are because like have you ever had gone to like a, a restaurant or something where they're like and at the bottom of the receipt here's a survey for you to fill out there's a reason why they're pointing that out it's because they get credit for you filling out that survey and they have to meet a certain threshold. Um, and if they don't, then they get talked to. I need to start filling out those surveys. And, I feel like I get them all the time. And in addition to that, yeah, I know, right? It's just people don't know. And so, and in addition to that, like there are metrics within those surveys that they have to meet. Like you have to get a four or a five out of five uh, or else anything below a three, you get talked to. Like there are some serious metrics and it varies by location, but there are some serious metrics associated with those. And um, so that's why I'm saying like this, this type of thing is already being captured and, and collected uh, just in different ways, different performance metrics. And so it's like now it's just a, a automated um, artificial intelligence system that is 
looking at them and flagging them for employers, uh, the managers to come and talk to the employees about. Yeah, so I think that's another good point. I mean, this already exists. They've just now put in an algorithm. Right. Yeah, I, I don't know. Overall, we'll have to see how this works out and how sort of these employees re- react to it. I don't know. I, I, I feel like I would have a negative view of the company that I work for if there were cameras watching over my shoulder the entire time, monitoring my performance, like, and maybe this is just because I, I know I perform well, like, I, I don't I don't need a babysitter. Like, just let me do my job. It's a little different for us, but, you know, where we don't have these hard and fast metrics that we have to meet. Well, um, I worked at a place that actually, like, monitored my, basically monitored my computer and what I was doing and how long I was in, in the application, keystrokes per hour and that sure. kind of stuff. So, I mean, it, it does exist in some places, for yeah. sure. Even in our kinds of lines of work, so I, I don't know. It's it's kind of it's tough, right? Because I wouldn't want somebody feeling they, I wouldn't want to work somewhere where I felt like they didn't they trust had, you. Yeah, they didn't trust me, or they felt like they needed to be watching all their employees to like get every ounce of, out of them. Yeah, because um, I just don't think that's going to at at the end of the day create the environment that you want out of your company. Anyhow. No, you want employees to feel comfortable and happy at the job, so that way they stay and work longer for you. And I just I don't know. I don't get it. Anyway. You know what time it is. What time is it? It came from. It came from. That's right. It's time for It Came From Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about. Any subreddit is fair game as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion amongst the community. That's us. Uh, so, Blake, we ha- <laughs> What? Stop. That's us. Yeah, I'm just so, so excited. Um, okay, Blake, we got, uh, what, two of these things? I think we got time for both of them, but let me just check. Yeah, we got time for both of them. All right, which one do we want to tackle first? Let's go with the first one first. I think that works. All right. So this is uh, from the user experience subreddit by UX Anonymous. This is going to be a really tough question, Blake, so Uh-oh. buckle in. All right, this is, imagine you have two different UIs, and you want to know which one is the best. What would you do? They go on to write, Hi, all. I'm an aspiring user researcher, and this question always stumps me. Uh, My approach would have just been, ask the difference between the two UI and what purpose do they serve. Do an A-B test, post-survey, or one-to-one feedback session to help uh, back up the data from the A-B test. Look over these research data and examine which yielded the best outcome, and then select the right UI. I have a feeling that this probably isn't all that needs to be done, and there's much more research methods I've missed. So I'm wondering... How should I have gone about this? Interesting. So uh, I'm a little confused by the question, per my usual, right? So it, I'm, I'm wondering if some, if he's getting the question, he or she, the anonymous UX or UX anonymous, if they're getting a question like in interviews or something of what's the best way to determine if two UIs, which one's the better choice to go with? Um, in which case, I would say take the methods that you have kind of laid out, Google them, See which one do you think yields the best in the shortest amount of time. And I think A-B test is a great one to go with if you have the time, resources, all that kind of good stuff. But if you don't, okay, go with one of your other methods, like interaction with, interacting with people or whatever it may be. Um, but I, r- honestly, with everything that's listed there, I think doing an A-B test between two UIs, especially if it's two like website landing pages or conversion pages, whatever it may be, is going to yield a lot of helpful information that could help you make the decisions. What, what do you think, Nick? It depends. It, absolutely, it depends. Yeah, Nick's had enough. He's out of here. He doesn't want anything to do with this question. Blake, you're still on. It's, i, I got to get back at the mic. Oh, my goodness. So I, I don't know. I think that you c- you can always add more methods into these kind of studies, but really, A/B test should be enough. No, look. Okay, so it d- it does depend, and I I know it's a cop out answer. It's the tagline of the show, but yeah, sure, it does because what exactly are you comparing between the two? Um, are you are you comparing uh, a workflow between the two? Well, then look at you know the golden path on both and see what's more discoverable for that workflow. It, it it just depends. It depends on what exactly the parameters of your research question are. Are you trying to get them to discover an aspect of that UI sooner, right? Maybe look at eye tracking. Maybe look at other methodology. There's a methodology that kind of fits everything that you're doing. It just depends on what that research question is. And Yeah, I think like you have to figure out what does it mean between 
what's the difference between UIs? What does that actually mean? What, which yeah. one's best? What does best mean? Or is, right, is which one I, is perceived better by the users? Yeah. That's a survey. Like well, you know, there's there's all these different methods that you can take, and I think our job as human factors professionals uh, and UX folks, I think our job is to take the research question, translate that into methodology that will uh, adequately meet that question and then perform that methodology on the user interface in question and then use that data from that analysis to inform an iterative design cycle. I think that's pretty much it. I mean, the only thing that I could see that's tricky here is if you just don't have, if you do not have the resources to do an A-B test, what do I do? Because that, that's an important part that I found in, across my experience, like doing human factors work or if I'm doing UX or if I'm even just doing front-end development is what do I actually have time and resources to do in the project span? Um, so that's that's an important thing to think about when you're asking research questions is really what can you even do within the funding that you have. But I think the methodology you laid out makes a lot of sense. But again, know what the real crux of the question is. Yep, that's it. All right, we got one more. Uh, this is posted by BU Blue... Wait, by Blue Erd. Blue Erd. Blue Erd. Blue underscore Erd. Shit, Blakey picked the longest one. All right. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's because I make you read all the stories every week. Absolutely. That's why. Absolutely. Okay. All right. This one's titled uh, Interested in HFE. What is this from the UX subreddit? This uh, is from. Oh, no, this is from the Human, Human Factors, Factors subreddit. subreddit. Great. <clears throat> all right. Interested in HFE. Hello. I am. Uh, I, they put an exclamation point. All right, what, what am I supposed to say? Uh, I am currently studying industrial systems engineering at Kennesaw State University, and I saw a, and a graduate in twelve days. Grad and I graduate in twelve days. I took a course called Human Machine Systems, which was really Human Factors. The book we used was called Designing for People: An Intro to HFE. I applied to the University of Washington for their Human Centered Design Engineering, but I did not get in. I will probably graduate with. Uh, 2.98 or 2.99, depending on how I finish the semester. I'm taking a lot of credits and ready to finish my undergraduate. I work for two years as UPS, part-time hub industrial engineer. What am I What am I reading this for? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the question? I perform work measurement analysis to determine our staffing, production, volume plans. Uh, I'm going to skip down to the question here. They're looking at how to get an entry job in yeah. HFE. I ended up leaving this January because I wanted to finish my first degree and take next steps uh, to get into HFE. I cannot find any entry-level jobs for HFE. I've done lots of research, and it se seems like uh, I need a degree to get into the field. I'm open to working in an IE position that will help me advance, but I just do not know what job will help me get into it. Looking for any and every ideas on what my next step should be. I live near Georgia Tech, and I really like their engineering psychology program. I know I'd need an above average GRE score to have any chance to get into the GT. I plan to study that or study for that this summer. Okay, Blake. How do you get an entry level HFE position? Dude, if you live in Georgia if you live in Georgia and you live near Georgia Tech, go volunteer for one of their labs. Uh, that would be the, the best way I would know to go about it, especially if you're worried about your GPA not being able to get you into get you into the program. Um, I honestly, I'm, I'm having a hard time believing that you're not being able to find any entry level HFE jobs. I'm not saying that it would be easy, but if you actually have an undergraduate degree that is HFE related, I feel like that is not something that's typical or it definitely wasn't when I was, no. when I was in school or when I went into grad school, I don't know. I only knew one other per one person out of all of my cohort that even had gone and gotten a human factor specific degree in undergrad. So you should have a leg up for sure. I mean, one other way to really tackle it is start using social media to help you try and find where people could use help from a human factors perspective. I mean, I don't know. Could you work with a medical device company for free around? Because I know there's a lot in Georgia. I know there's a lot near Georgia Tech. Um, there's just a lot of ways you could try and volunteer your time. I know there's a lot of meetups in Georgia or centered around Georgia Tech as well that have to do with human factors, psychology, UX. Um, just start trying to get involved community-wise and maybe just take – whatever job you can and support yourself for now. I'm not really sure what IE is. I'm guessing that's industrial engineering. Yeah. But you have a lot of chances to, I mean, see growth in your position, too. So if you can get an IE job somewhere, well, start trying to inject human factors into that position. Ba basically get the job and then start writing your own position requirements and how you can improve the products. Um, but again, I mean, you can always 
get and one I guess the last thing I would say is if you get a job that's industrial engineering or entry level HFE and you really want to get like a master's or a PhD, go to school or work a job and get some experience and that will help you get into any kind of program if you feel like your GRE or your GPA is not really cutting it. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities for entry level. Um, and I echo your sentiment, Blake. I, I find it hard to believe that there's no entry level jobs. It might also depend on where you're looking for jobs. If you are looking for, um, you know, entry level jobs, are you looking in places that you want to live in or are you looking everywhere? Because sometimes there are positions available in, in less de- desirable places. Uh, no, speaking from experience. Uh, but, you know, like, uh, I think really take a look at what's out there. And honestly, if you've worked in a lab, even I, I would consider that experience. I, it, it's all about how you shape your experience. And, you know, this is, this might be controversial. I don't know if you've worked in a lab, um, you can say I've, I've worked in a lab and, uh, you I know, mean, that's part of the reason you even work in a lab. Yeah. Right? Is to say that you've had exposure to, this type of stuff which in undergrad i don't know if you necessarily have to do that maybe that's part of the problem maybe yeah i I don't know but like blake said find a lab find uh, a meetup um find people with like interests and and start networking and join a local hfes chapter because i know that georgia tech has one because i think the former president or current president of some organization no former president of hfes frank durso i do believe he teaches classes there and and there's definitely a student chapter, and you don't have to be a member of the university to join a student chapter, or at least volunteer as part of it. So there's a lot of ways in to help you kind of get a little bit more experience, meet people, that kind of stuff. Yeah, make friends. Maybe reach out to people on the Human Factors Cast Slack and see if they have any entry-level positions available to you. Yeah, or, uh, you know, go on LinkedIn, search Human Factors in- entry-level, and apply for every job you see. Yeah. Just I mean, do the interviews. Who cares if it's, like, not a place you want to live? Just have all the interviews. Yeah, or even if it's, like, a, a middle-tier job. Like, just just apply. Just apply. Do it. Go through the go through the motion. I believe in you. All right, you can do it. All right, so that's going to be it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think about our stories this week. If you're a Patreon supporter, no after show this week, because i got to go home and tend to a pregnant partner. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You know, for the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow any of our social channels at Attractors Podcast. Uh, if you want to email us directly, that's show at humanfactorscast.com. If you like what you hear and want to support the show, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice. Like and subscribe on YouTube, guys. We're, We're almost there. Almost there. Every week. Almost there. So close. Uh, you know, or consider supporting us on Patreon. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about delivery drones? If you want to talk about delivery drones, you can always find me in the Human Factors Cast Slack or across social media at Don't Panic UX. Special thanks to Jeff Olson for video editing each and every week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time. What does it do? It's... We just told this guy. It depends. (laughs) depends.